<clears throat> Welcome back to the GBC Institute. I'm your instructor, Dr. Gino Bradley, and this course is the history of tax and the IRS timeline. Now, here, we're going to give you guys a little treat for those of you who are tax nerds out there and love everything related to the tax and accounting industry. For those of you who are not tax nerds, and this is just a hustle for you, um, you're just trying to find a way to get money, then this will still be pretty helpful for you as well to help you get acclimated into our industry as you're coming in to this industry from other industries. <clears throat> so sit back and relax. I'm gonna go do a uh, very quick timeline from the beginning to today on the Internal Revenue Service and the history of tax, with, including the authority to tax. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. IRS history timeline. We're just gonna do a few highlights. 1765, taxation without representation was the seed of the American Revolution. The colonists rebelled against Britain for punitive taxes because they had no voice in parliament. July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence served, uh, excuse me, severed the ties with England. The Revolutionary War ended in 1783, and a new nation was born. The evolution of taxation. February 21st, 1787, Congress approved the Constitutional Convention to revise the Articles of Confederation. The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excesses to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. On September 2nd, 1789, Congress established the Department of the Treasury, 1789. The Whiskey Rebellion, 1794, saw the first outright challenge to the US government's revenue laws when a federal court summoned 75 distillers in Western, Western Pennsylvania to appear in court and explain why they shouldn't be arrested for whiskey tax evasion. The Whiskey Rebellion set a clash between the citizens and federal officers. The federal government prevailed for the cost of $1.5 million to the taxpayers. The War of 1812, to pay for the War of 1812, Congress passed new internal taxes on refined sugar, carriages, distillers, and auction sales, and reinstated the commissioner of the revenue to collect them. And August 24th, 1814, the British burned the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C. So well after the Revolutionary War, well after we had uh, the Americans, the, the young Americans had just got done fighting for their freedom, the British still came back and burned the Treasury Building. On December 23rd, 1817, Congress repealed these and all remaining internal taxes and abolished the position of the Commissioner of Revenue. They abolished the revenue system in 1817. The Treasury gets a new home. This is an architectural drawing of the building that was to come approximately 1836 to 1842, during the time period they were building it. Civil War expenses. July 1st, 1862, President Lincoln signed the second revenue measure of the Civil War into law. The, this law levied internal taxes and established a permanent internal tax system. Notice, internal and permanent. Abraham Lincoln. Congress established the Office of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue under the Department of Treasury on July 17, 1862, and George Boutwell became its first commissioner. Property seizures and tax refunds. In the first year, 1863, the Office of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue collected $39.1 million. Of course, the year before, they had collected pretty much zero. So. You can bet they thought he was doing a pretty good job, okay? Now, then they authorized the Commissioner of the Internal uh, Revenue to com comprise, uh, compromise all suits relating to internal revenue and to abate outstanding assessments and to refund taxes subject to current regulations, okay? So, a few changes there. To the people of the United States, by an act of Congress, approved 
Secretary of the Treasurer is authorized to issue an amount not exceeding 200 millions of dollars in Treasury notes. U.S. Treasury Department, Washington, 19, excuse me, 1864. State of the art technology. In February 1867, the Secretary of the Treasury adopted a hydrometer to establish a uniform system to inspect and gauge alcoholic spirits that were subject to tax. Uh, March 1867, the Revenue Act authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to adopt, procure, and prescribe these and other weighing and gauging instruments to detect fraud by distillers. So uh, you want to make sure you got just a, uh, enough. Um, that you're taxing the right amount. So they started using technology. Pretty cool. That's old fashioned technology. Let's talk about personal privacy. Representative James Garfield of Ohio spearheaded an effort to make tax information private. On April 5th, 1870, IRS Commissioner Delano forbade tax assessors from furnishing a list of taxpayers for publication. They used to publish a full list of taxpayers, okay? Now, Congress passed a Revenue Act stating, no collector shall permit to be published in any manner such income returns or any parts thereof except general statistics. So privacy was even important way back in 1870 when there was no digital life. People still had a right to their privacy and they cared about their personal privacy. The first federal income tax. Let's take a look at the first formed. February 25th, 1913. The 16th Amendment officially became a part of the Constitution, granting Congress constitutional authority to levy taxes on corporate and individual income. The Bureau of Internal Revenue established a personal income tax division and correspondence unit to answer a flood of questions about its enforcement and a special division within general counsel to prepare opinions of interpreting internal revenue laws. The first 1040 form, 1914. Public awareness, the four, the four minute men. These are the guys that were responsible for going around the country getting the word out that there's new tax laws and things are changing. 1919, prohibition. Congress passed the National Prohibition Enforcement Act on October 27, 1919. It prohibited the manufacture, sale, and use of intoxicating beverages. It also designated the Bureau of Internal Revenue as the enforcement agency. The Bureau hired and trained hundreds of prohibition agents to enforce the law and created a new intelligence unit to uncover corrupt prohibition agents and bootleggers. So they went through a whole lot of transition during this period saying that it was not good for America for people to get boozed up. Uh, we're not getting political here. You think about it, what you think about it. Think a look at where we are today, uh, where we were back then, and to each his own. 1919, Prohibition. The Bureau of Internal Revenue gets a new home. Remember, they started building that building. They started building that building a long time ago. But remember, the British burned it to the ground at one point. So, of course, they needed a new building. On June 1st, 1930, the main section of the new Internal Revenue Service building opened, 16 months ahead of schedule, with a total construction cost of just over $6 million. In addition, a state-of-the-art fire alarm system, it contained 1,400 telephones and a synchronized system of 861 clocks, the largest system of its kind at the time, Internal Revenue Service, being innovative again. Innovative, the tax the American taxpayer. Al Capone, 1925 to 1931. American gangster Alphonse Al Capone attained fame during Prohibition era by ranking, excuse me, by raking in millions of dollars through bootlegging and other illicit activities. 1931, an IRS intelligence unit investigation led to his indictment on federal income tax evasions and violations of the Volstead Act. He pled guilty, was convicted, and sentenced to 11 years in federal prison a $50,000 fine in order to pay $215,000 plus interest on back taxes. That was a lot of money back in 1925 to 1931. Payroll withholding. Let's fast forward to 1935. On August 14, 1935, Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act. Employees originally paid 1% of the first $3,000 of their salaries to finance the benefits. 
the law required a new system of tax withholding, which the Bureau of Internal Revenue had to collect and turn over to the Social Security Trust Fund. It also created an unemployment compensation program and laid the foundation for our modern payroll withholding, 1935 to 1940, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The victory tax. The Roosevelt administration hoped to pay for at least half of the cost of World War II by increased taxation. 1942 Revenue Act sharply increased most of the existing taxes. <laughs> Introduced by the victory tax, a 5% surcharge on all net income over $624 with a post-war credit lowered the exemptions and began provisions for medical and dental expenses and investors' expense deductions. Still, taxes only funded 43% of the war's cost, 7% short of the goal. They were hoping they would be able to collect at least half of what it cost to fund the war, but they got pretty close. They got 43%. Early tax collection, modernization, 1948, 1950, 52, and 1948, the Bureau introduced punch card equipment. So punch cards helped them fast forward a little bit faster from handwritten notes to the punch cards, helped just a little bit, but we had to keep on moving. That wasn't enough. Internal Revenue Service was created. 1953, 1952, President Harry S. Truman called for a comprehensive reorganization of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. The agency officially became the Internal Revenue Service on July 9th, 1953. Taxpayer communication and support, 1950 to the present. So in the 1950s, the service primarily interacted with taxpayers through written and print communication using the U.S. Postal Service and walk-in offices. Walk-in offices or tax assistance centers continue to provide assistance to taxpayers to this day. Public outreach, 1953 to 1959. The IRS began teaching taxes, the teaching taxes program by mailing a tax kit with a teaching kit and large copies of the tax forms and regular return forms for 30,000 junior and senior high school principals. By 1959, the IRS offered public service announcements to television and radio stations throughout the year, not just during the filing season. IRS modernizes its data 1959 to 1962. Secretary of the Treasurer approves a plan to install a nationwide automatic data processing system. Pretty cool. Still pretty outdated right now. You see how fast we fast forward it beyond that. President Kennedy vi visited the IRS on May 1st, 1961. President John F. Kennedy attended the Joint Conference of Regional Commissioners, Commissioners and District Directors of the IRS, the only U.S. president to visit IRS headquarters. President Kennedy praised the service for pursuing fair ta taxation in the promotion of the natural, national interest. Invention of the Tingle Table, the Tingle Table for over 50 years. Tingle Tables have served, excuse me, have saved taxpayers millions of dollars by reducing the time it takes IRS employees to sort through individual paper filed returns. In 1962, James Tingle invented the table while working at an IRS service center. Mr. Tingle built the prototype in his backyard, still in use today. Over 15 million tax returns flowed through the Tingle Tables during the 2019 tax filing season. That is a great tidbit. Taxpayer service, toll free, telephone networking system piloted in 1966 eventually allowed the IRS to handle most taxpayer inquiries by phone. On January uh, 1967, the IRS launched a nationwide automated federal tax system. The same year, the IRS uh, established a long range study to determine the, automatic, the automated data processing requirements through 1970 and beyond. The IRS reaches out to more taxpayers. 1972, they began to offer more tax information in Spanish. So that's pretty cool. More forms, uh, more availability. It helps them to collect more revenue. Faster, more accurate service. 1978, 1978 was a good year. The IRS installed a remittance processing system, RPS, and a mail sorting system in all service systems. The system automated, automated the sorting and opening of all income tax returns at a rate of 22,000 pieces of mail per hour with a 98% accuracy rate. In contrast, the top speed of the manual sort process it replaced was 1,200 pieces an hour. So from 22, from 1,200 pieces an hour, 22,000 pieces an hour, it's pretty cool. Tax Reform Act of 1986, 
all right, this is the last time the taxes were truly overhauled. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that happened here recently that went into effect just, uh, January 1st, 2018, you know, the, the, the Trump administration has claimed that it was the first major tax reform since 1986. Here's your proof. U.S. Congress passed the Tax Reform Act to simplify the income tax code. The service marked a pivotal change in the way it interacted with taxpayers by beginning the progression from paper-based filing to electronic filing. Service design, 1978 to 1988, they studied the economic, social, and behavioral factors and impact taxpayer compliance. In 1986, the IRS established Artificial Intelligence Laboratory as a part of an initiative to explore the potential applications of new technologies and tax processing. All right, the IRS revived its Understanding Taxes program for high school students so that they can help more people understand. All right, taxpayers' rights. In 1988, the IRS published Publication One, Your Rights as a Taxpayer, which required the IRS to fully inform taxpayers of their rights as a taxpayer and the process for examination, appeal, collection, and refunds. Your rights as a taxpayer, publication one. <clears throat> IRS bulletin board, system and IRS e-file, National Technical Information Service, NTIS established, Fed World in 1992 to serve as the online locator service for extensive inventory of information distributed by the federal government. Two years later, 1994, NTIS launched a bulletin board system to, to support the IRS, giving the service the ability to provide forms and publications online. 1994, 1994, tax forms went online. Digital Daily, Digital Daily. The Digital Daily was the first presence of the IRS on the World Wide Web. It had a warm and humorous tone and had a design resembled a newspaper. The site grew and evolved into irs.gov, which had more than 609 million visits in 2018. irs.gov. Kind of morphed from over here to over here to this is what it looks like now. It's a lot more tidy, a lot more efficient. This is what it looks like on your phone. Reconstructing, oh, excuse me, restructuring and reform of 1998. IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998 prompted the most comprehensive reorganization and modernization of IRS in nearly half a century. The IRS reorganized itself in 2000 to closely resemble the private sector, which is private, privately owned businesses, creating four major business divisions, each aligned to a group, excuse me, to a group of taxpayers with similar needs. Digital tools for taxpayers. The IRS leaned into digital innovation, launching multiple tools, the withholding calculator, where's my refund, free file, taxpayer local, local assistance office locator, sales tax deduction calculator. So more digital online tools, including online payments. Now, here's the digital tools for tax professionals. It continued effort to move toward a paperless filing process. The IRS launched digital solutions for tax professionals. 2004, the transcript delivery service. And 2008, the electronic pen signature. Client individual tax returns electronically filed and signed. E-file works much, much better because of the digital pen signatures. IRS student aid tool, the FAFSA. This is also another IRS invention. The IRS goes mobile. Mobile app. As taxpayers move toward mobile devices, the IRS developed applications to meet the demand. In January 2011, the IRS launched its first native mobile application, irs to go The app initially allowed taxpayers to check the status of their refunds and returns from their mobile devices. Subsequent updates left users let users access free tax preparation assistance linked to IRS news and use the app in Spanish. Taxpayer Bill of Rights, 2014, Commissioner John Kosinkin, taxpayer advocate Nina Olson released an enhanced Taxpayer Bill of Rights written to be clear and understandable and accessible for both, tax, for both taxpayers and IRS employees. The updated document grouped dozens of existing rights in the tax code into 10 fundamental rights. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights is displayed in IRS offices across the country as a reminder that respecting taxpayer rights continues to be a top priority for IRS employees. Tax Design Challenge. The IRS hosted its first 
crowdsourcing competition that encouraged to innovate ideas for the taxpayer experience of the future. Of 48 submissions, winners from California, Minnesota, and Washington, D.C. were among these selected in these categories. Overall design, taxpayer usefulness, best financial capability. Online account. In November 2016, the IRS launched online account. Now you can log in and get to your own personal account. This is a fabulous tool. But you must have your personal data uh, readily available so that you can verify your identity in order to gain access. August 2017, IRS.gov team launched a major refresh of the website. The new site was designed to be accessible for people with disabilities, viewable on mobile devices, and organized for taxpayers to quickly find what they need. Another revamp in 2017. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We talked about that a little earlier. Let's go into a little bit more. December 22nd, 2017, President Donald J. Trump signed into law, HR1, known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or TCJA. The most significant piece of tax reform legislation in decades. Today, the IRS continues its mission to provide America's taxpayers with top quality service by helping them to understand and meet their tax responsibilities and enforce the law with integrity and fairness to all. Hey, IRS is on social media, just in case you didn't know. As a part of his mission to help taxpayers understand and meet their tax responsibilities, the IRS added Instagram to his social media. Let's take a look at what they have. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Pretty cool. The new 1040. The new 1040 is about the size of a postcard. It's very small, very short. However, it's, 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 the fact that it got smaller doesn't really mean it got more easier or, more, or less complicated because it's just been replaced by six or seven more pieces of paper. Now, instead of having a long 1040, which is two pages, covers everything you need, now you have a 1040 that's a page and a half. So this half page is kind of weird. But you also have six other schedules, and you have to decide what schedule you need and then attach it to the 1040. But this, this, this right here was, in my opinion, um, pretty much largely a failure. But the, the certain groups in American uh, legislature and the Congress and the Senate have always been trying for years and years and years to make the 1040 the size of a postcard. The only thing they did was change the name and address portion to make that the size of a postcard. You still have tons of paperwork, and actually, you actually have even more paperwork now. Criminal Investigation Sentinel. Centennial, excuse me, 1919. Treasury Secretary asked the IRS Commissioner to form a criminal investigation unit to go after tax cheats and other criminals. 100 years later, the Criminal Investigation, or CI, special agents continue to bring down the most notorious criminals. CI remains the only law enforcement agency with the authority to investigate tax crimes and has earned the reputation as the premier financial investigation unit in the world. So that has been your history lesson on the IRS and taxation timeline. Thank you, as usual, for attending this course at the GBC Institute. And it is our pleasure to have you here. So I would just say, take a look at the document that we have posted right here in our school at the GBC Institute. You can actually take, take a look at this a little bit more slowly and read a little bit deeper into it. I, I personally enjoyed the art, artwork. So I would just say, um, if there's something that you wanna take a look at, then feel free to spend the time to go ahead and look back through all of this artwork because this document is actually posted in the same section as this video, okay? So this has been your IRS history timeline. GBC Institute. I am your instructor, Dr. Gino Bradley. Feel free to learn more about us and who we are and what we're doing at www.gbctaxpros.com.